Hello. Hi, everybody. My name's Louisa Rose, and I'm the founder of Now and Beyond, um, taking place today on Inside Out Day. So I'm delighted to welcome you all here for what promises to be a really interesting conversation about children's and parents' mental health. We have shouted this from the rooftops, but for those of you who haven't heard, way in the back, Now and Beyond is the UK's first ever mental health festival for schools. Um, a team of volunteers have put it together in the last five months, and today we've actually seen almost 1,500 schools take part, engaging in mental health and wellbeing conversations, activities with their students, their teachers, and with their parents. It's We've seen a phenomenal response, no doubt triggered um, in part, maybe mostly, by the immense pressure that's facing all of us just now. But by no means does our work stop here. So our volunteer army that now includes about 350 mental health experts from all over the UK are united in this mission of forging long-term relationships um, with schools to create meaningful change. So why are we actually here right now? Well. I think that we can all agree that it's hard enough to be a parent um, or a carer without a pandemic, homeschooling and working from home thrown into the mix. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to two people whose invaluable experience will offer insight and support in this area. I'd like to welcome you to child and adolescent consultant psychiatrist Dr Dickon Bevington, whose role as the medical director of the Anna Freud Centre and whose work in the NHS and father of three positions them quite firmly at the forefront of youth mental health. Um, it's also my great pleasure to introduce you to BBC broadcaster and journalist Kate Silverton, whose interest in children's mental health now sees her not only undertaking a training with Place to Be to become one of their really urgently needed school counsellors, but also a first time author. Kate's new book, There's No Such Thing as Naughty, explores how children's behaviour is shaped by their brain development. So for the next four to five minutes or so, I urge you to please use this opportunity to ask Kate and Dickon for advice on not only your children's mental health, but also your own. Please engage in the conversation, use the chat box that you'll see along the right hand side. And don't worry, if you need a cup of tea, I missed a couple of minutes. We're recording this, so we'll send you all tomorrow. Um, doesn't leave me anything more but to say over to you, Kate and Dickon. How exciting. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We all know how precious time is right now. I'm going to let Dickon start because you're going to, I've, I've appointed you yeah. host. Have you? <laughs> Thank you, Kate. <laughs> um, it, it, it's great to be here. And um, I, I hope that what what Kate and I can sort of talk about, we can be talking as much as we can on behalf of and about the things that 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 um, those of you who are watching um, are interested in and that feel important. And um, we thought it would be just helpful if we just talked a little bit about who who we are. E everybody knows Kate, thankfully, um, and very few people luckily know me, uh, which is probably a blessing. Um, um, but Kate, do you, do you want to just talk a little bit first of all about how, how you and I first met and what got you yeah. interested in, in children's mental health? I'd be delighted to. Um, the reason everybody why I'm slightly giddy is because Dickon is like the best person ever. Um, I, my, a little bit for my background to, 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 to put it into context, so my academic background is in psychology. Um, it took me a very long time to become a mum and I'd been working with a lot of children's charities but I think because I wasn't a mum I stood back a little bit and then miraculously um, had children in my 40s um, and so my interest was really revived and in a way that I as much as I wanted to look after my children's physical health, I really wanted to understand how I could best look after their emotional, their mental health. And I was so lucky to have had the contact that I'd had with the Anna Freud Center, um, with Place to Be, with the NSPCC and other charities. And so I started doing a lot of research, talking to lots of neuroscientists, psychiatrists around the world. And what they were telling me blew me away about our children's brains. And so there was a point at which I said to Anna Freud, we need to be getting this out there. This is just incredible. It's helped me with my parenting. It's made life so much easier and a lot more fun. And Dickon and I sat and had a cup of tea right where I'm sat in my kitchen. And I literally said to Dickon, please, can you bring your brain, which he's got right over his shoulder. So we're going to just talk about that because my passion is 
is, is to take the science and to make it accessible for all parents and teachers everywhere. Because when we understand what is driving our behavior and our children's behavior, life actually becomes so much more simple. Now, I'm not talking about the acute end because obviously Dick, and, and as he will explain now, where his work is very focused is the more acute end. What I'm talking about and what I'll be talking about tonight is in the main, our very young children. But what we know now is what we experience when we're very young will shape our brain and, and really influence the person we become. And so that's been my fascination. I've been working in the field for the last sort of 10 to 15 years and have, have I, I had been so overwhelmed by the number of parents that I spoke to during lockdown at the very beginning and how the struggles that everybody was having and obviously sort of the challenges myself, um, the obvious ones that we all have when homeschooling. And so I wrote a book and uh, Dickens contributed. It's, it's been, it, it, I, I've, I've loved it um, because it just for me has made the science accessible and I think it empowers parents to kind of go, oh, that's what's going on. You're not being naughty. You're acting out what you're feeling inside. And that is your language. And actually, when you, you're speaking to me with your, with your behavior, I'm actually able to help a lot more than if I'm feeling that something is wrong. So it's really, for me, there's no shame, there's no blame. I want to demystify, I want to open up the science to everybody. And as I say, Dickon is one of the best people I know in doing that from his professional perspective. So Dickon, if you could tell us a little bit about your work on a day-to-day -day basis, a bit about your background um, and, and kind of where our work aligns, as it were. Yeah. Um... I, I just have to, to, to say after an introduction like that, Gail, I'm going to have to just prepare everyone to be sort of gently disappointed. <laughs> but, um, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a medical doctor and um, uh, I, I, I now work as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work in the NHS in a really wonderful team um, working with young people who have really quite a multiple difficulties, some of which fulfill the sort of mental health difficulty criteria, trauma, other mental health difficulties like anxiety. Um, uh, others are more, much more around their problematic use of drugs and alcohol, and then a whole multiplicity of difficulties that the same young people are trying to deal with, which is, you know, to deal with family breakdown, homelessness, exploitation, uh, criminal exploitation, and all kinds of... So these are very vulnerable young people. So that's kind of, if you like, quite... Um, uh, you know it's well it's not that small a population but it's kind of you know out, out of most the range of where most young people um end up and my other part of my week i, I work um uh, at a, a wonderful charity called the anna freud national center for children and families where i'm uh, rather pompously described as the medical director but that kind of means i just i suppose what i do there is um a a, a, a mix of research and evaluating novel ways of trying to work with families and young people and children that they experience as a little bit more acceptable a little bit more that makes sense and is more usable um, and that we experience because we're trying to look at this as more effective than what we've got already um, so we're trying to pull together both clinical experience parents and young people's own experience who've used and are using services and our sort of research hats to try and sort of kind of push things along into, well, you know, how do, we, how do we get better at doing this? Because we're quite good at helping a lot of problems, but actually a lot of problems, you know, we like how medicine has been always, there's things that we just don't really know enough about yet, and we, we've got ideas. Um, so that's my kind of professional life. I've, you know, mentioned I've, I've raised three children. They're, uh, I don't know if they're watching or not, but uh, they're still around. Um, and, uh, you know, um, so I suppose I have some sort of experience of the, 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 the challenges that are involved in um, parenting. And, you know, but what I don't have is the direct experience of parenting younger children during a pandemic. And I'm incredibly aware of the fact that, you know, something's happened over the last year, Kate, that, that has these are not new issues and the problems that we're dealing with are not that new, but they're just suddenly much, much more apparent as everything else gets sort of a little bit stripped away. Um, and I think we'll sort of keep coming back to that. Um, so I, I, I wonder if, Kate, it's helpful now that we just sort of try to 
perhaps think a little bit about how, how we should sort of structure our, our conversation, our chat. We've got a lot of questions. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just, I suppose in the spirit of trying to disappoint people gently, we're not going to get through them all, but we, we've kind of, we've got a sort of, some big sort of clusters that we'll try and, we might try and think a little bit about one by one. Yeah, absolutely. I think we should. And I think, I think really it's, it's key for everybody to have their questions as many as we can answered. So I'm very happy to get stuck in. I think I'd like to throw in at that point, actually, Dickon, um, and you and I have spoken about it before, that the isolation that, that we've seen in, in the pandemic, I think, as you say, has exacerbated maybe a lot of what parents feel. Certainly when I was writing the book, it struck me. And I wanted to just take a moment to talk about community and the power of it because I did a, a talk for, for this day earlier on today, and there is a real power in coming together. And I think as parents, we, we, we maybe forget, we are all things now, we're working, we're cooking, we're cleaning, we're, you know, we are all things. And it never used, it didn't used to be like that when we lived in extended families in more traditional communities where we would have round the clock care and help and support and the wisdom of the elders. So I think it's, I just wanted to start by saying, to take a bit of a breath, to kind of go, do you know what? It is hard right now. It's hard. It, the nuclear family setup is, it has been hard for quite some time in how we've sort of set ourselves up in our society. And then we have this situation. So it's okay to be finding it hard. And I wanted to ask you firstly, Dickon, that, that I've had a lot of parents say, to, say with some sense of, sort of fear really of kind of that they're finding it tough and I'm like yeah <laughs> it, it is really tough right now and to look at helping ourselves to regulate and what and, and giving ourselves permission to to accept that actually it is very hard it's not just that we I think often with parents we think I'm doing something wrong or there's something wrong with my child and I speak for quite a few of my friends and the school mums that I speak to. And actually, it's not that, is it? It's just we are we are having a normal reaction to abnormal circumstances. So I think it's just to sort of try and bring us all down to a regulated place before we begin with some pretty difficult questions in, in, in some aspects. Yeah. And I, I suppose the other things about the, the questions, Kate, what, we, we, won't, we won't try to... Um answer sort of very, very specific personal questions in, in an open forum like this. But we'll try and, if there are questions that are obviously quite sort of decent, we'll, we'll try and kind of, if you like, talk around them in, as, as a more general one, uh, because, you know, confidentiality and, and these things need, need, need to just be a little bit thought about. I, I'm, I'm tr we're going to both try to keep a look at the screen. So if I'm touching, I'm not, I'm not doing anything other than looking at the messages. Let's do some ones and try and get through because I know we're probably going to get quite a few Dickon. So the first one, um, I struggle with mental health. I worry I'm going to pass this on into my children that they will start to reflect this. How do I avoid that? And at the same time show that it's OK that sometimes mummy is poorly. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, I think that's a it's a really great question and it kind of speaks to what you you mentioned at the beginning that um i think it's very easy as parents for us to get terribly isolated with our anxious thoughts about how to do the best parenting i can and in a in a strange but actually scientifically understandable way the more passionately we feel love for our children the more vulnerable we are are actually not being able to sort of stop and take a breath and, and connect with another mind other than our children's minds that could help us calm down. Because what, what I'll, I'll perhaps say a little bit more about later on is how do our ch children grow minds at all? We know they grow brains. Brains are quite easy to grow. You just kind of feed the child and the brain grows. Minds are much more tricky to, 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 to grow. And they're not the same as a brain, are they? A mind is rather bigger than a brain. It kind of reaches out. So how do, how do minds grow? Well, the key thing, minds grow in as much as they are seen as minds by other trusted minds. And that, that sounds a bit kind of roundabout, but it's the more you treat your child as if they have a mind, the more chance they are that they will start to recognize that's that fact about themselves. And um, so we are from the very beginnings as as human beings, we are actually not individuals at all. John Donne, the poet, said no man is an island. You know, 
and, and it's it's true psychologically it's true developmentally that we form our image of ourself insofar as we see ourselves reflected in our mothers our fathers our grandmothers our teachers our carers eyes and if we see ourselves reflected back in a way that we think oh yeah you've got me that's it yeah no, that's that's what i'm feeling that's it yes that's how we start building this idea of me with different feelings there's different kinds of me there's a happy me there's a sad me there's a frightened me a curious me and i find that out by seeing it in my mother's or my carer's eyes and so I, that never changes we're always connected and i i rediscover the fact that i can think even in my job now because i've got team members who when i'm slightly sort of like Ooh, they'll say oh yeah no that's got under your skin hasn't it dickon and they'll they'll show me what i look like just by looking at me oh dickon you look a bit worried about this um, and that calms me down because i feel understood I feel, oh that's understandable and I, I talk a lot in, in in the book about children and actually in my work now in training as a counselor if children feel seen and heard you, you know this is a this is a this is a great really i would say i would venture to say if children feel seen and heard then we are really most of the way there as parents if we can allow our children and to come back to that question specifically and i obviously don't know that the mental health issues but what i would say is very few people actually are perfect so we all at some points and i think if we can the biggest thing i would say and i can only speak for me on this but if our, if my children can feel safe as in that I can contain and help them with their emotions, I don't have to be perfect all the time. Sometimes I'm gonna be really tired and I'm gonna shout. If I've just seen a work email and my kids are messing around, I might think, oh God, guys, can you just get to bed? I hate myself for that. And I know that it's actually the work email that's just come in. So I've already shouted, right? I've already done something that I don't really want to do. They're looking at me and then I can say, actually guys, I'm really sorry. Mummy's just tired and I've just had a work email and I'm just a bit, I take it away from them. So we don't want our children ever to think that it's, it's their fault that I'm shouting. It's my regulation. It's my responsibility. And I am not perfect. No parent is perfect. So if we can help our children to see sometimes mummy and daddy will get it wrong and actually say sorry for that. I'm really sorry, guys. I'm just really tired. Shall we sit down now and, have a, and, and, and read a book? It takes any of that sense that there is something wrong with them and allows them to kind of go, actually, mummy's got it back together again. So it's not unsafe. You know, she can hold it. And she's just showing me that sometimes she's she's not, you know, completely contained. So, as I say, I don't want to speak on behalf of your in terms of what your, your mental health issue is. But given that there's no per perfect parent, I think as long as we can remember that our children, if they feel that we are good enough, that we can take care of them in terms of their safety. And sometimes we're going to get it wrong. And in those moments, we can say sorry. Then actually, from my perspective, that gives me a good yardstick by which I would progress because I ain't going to be perfect the whole time. And Lord knows at the moment with the stresses of everything, we, none of us, none of us are. Um, there, there is um, a question in about the brain, Dick. And sorry, did you want to pick up on that? Yeah, just that there's some really sort of, you know, there's some really strong research now. You used a phrase that is a really famous phrase in child psychotherapy. You said you talked about a parent being good enough. And that comes from a very famous child psychotherapist called Donald Winnicott, quite a long time ago. And, and he, he's, he, he talked about the good enough parent, good enough mother. And the, and, and, and the next part of that phrase was, is the best. Because better than good enough is actually worse. If, you, if you're a perfect parent, why would your child ever leave? And do you really want to be parenting children that can never leave home? Of course you don't. And one of the reasons a parent, a child has to leave care of, of, of a parent is because they think, oh, I can't deal with this anymore. I've got to go out and make my own life. So good enough is actually the best possible parent. You demonstrate that forgiving yourself and a little bit of give and take is, is, is critical. And there's now science where, one of the things we do uh, quite a bit at the Anna Freud Center, but lots of other places too, where we do these kind of, we film interactions between parents and their children. And in this case, it was a study of parents with tiny little infants. And they would put a, an infant in their little carry cot and a big mirror beside the, the infant. 
Uh, and then we'd have a camera over the shoulder of the mother. So you'd see a picture of me, the infant, and, and then a mirror with the mother's face looking at me, kind of going, oh, poor you, Dickon, what are you going on? And um, so you could film both faces that were looking at each other simultaneously. And then they did this very boring thing that scientists do is that they chop these films up into kind of like, kind of just millisecond, tiny little bits. And then they incredibly boringly, in very painstakingly, according to very strict rules, they look for every little gesture that a baby makes. Oh. Oh. Yeah. And every little thing that happens, they then look and see what happens in the mother's face. And then they kind of try and match up. And they've got very boring ways that don't to be, to be looked at. Ways of working out how, when, when does this parent get a, a fit with what she offers back? And when does they just sort of slightly miss? And what they discovered was, you know, mothers who they'd already done a little bit of kind of looking at the mother, mothers who are defined as having secure attachment themselves and with their own infant, probably the most intimate relationship that you could imagine there ever being in the planet, a securely attached mother with her own infant, right? How often did those mothers get it right? About 30% of the time. Wow. About 70% of the time, they just miss just slightly misinterpreted. They see mm -hmm. they see the baby kind of making a sort of smiling sound and they think they're grinning. And then they watch for another kind of a couple of seconds and they realize mm, they're not grinning at all. They're doing something completely different. They just misinterpret us. And humans are misunderstanding machines. We're very good at misunderstanding each other. It's amazing, but occasionally we actually really do understand. And we then did these studies that looked at follow those kids. Follow the kids with these mothers who are kind of, you know, they're getting it right 30% of the time. There are some mothers that were getting it right 40, 50, 60% of the time. Interesting, when you follow their children for quite a few years, later on, the children whose mothers were these sort of super sensitive, super attuned, their children were less good at making sense of other children and putting themselves in other people's shoes. Uh, why do you think that is? So the little bit of disconnect is actually sort of helping to almost build the bond because it's sort of almost like, ooh, 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 come back, ooh, ooh, come back. And actually that's building. It's yeah, the little bit of disconnect. When, when you misinterpret me and I'm sort of, you know, looking a bit frightened and you think it's a bit of a laugh. So you make a, got a big grin and I'm thinking, oh, oh, now I'm really alone. That stimulates in my little baby brain a bit of an effort going, well, how come? Normally you, get, you often get it right. What's the difference? Why did you? Oh, I didn't make any noise. If I make a bit more sound, then mum will understand. So actually, when you get it a little bit wrong, it stimulates me to work a bit and try and work it out. And if we always get it right all the time for our children, humans are, we're kind of pretty lazy, actually. You know, if someone's going to do it for me, I'll, I'll let you do it all, Kate. So and, if you want to just carry on, I'll just chill. I think that's really reassuring and and I think another thing there's another question that I'd like to offer some reassurance on because there's a question saying you've spoken a lot about young or younger children what age might be considered too late to influence brain development is it possible to turn the clock back and start again so can I go first because you're gonna you're gonna fill up on the all the but just a quick one from me because what I learned from Dickon in my kitchen was that our brains don't stop developing, and, and actually they, they don't really stop developing ever, but you know, they're, they're, they're considered to be more fully formed by 25. So our children under 25 are literally in a, in a very sort of active state of, of process. And even then, as a lot of us can testify when we've had psychotherapy in our later years, that the brain continues to change. So, uh, and I think there was um, Dan Siegel, um, a really good doctor, he showed that he did therapy with a 90 year old and showed that you could actually sort of heal as it were. So my short answer on that is that of course, it is always possible to repair, if you want to put it like that, but that there's never an age that is too late. And that's why I really stress that time and again in my book, because I think as parents, it, when we talk about mental health, we can go to a place of panic thinking, I've done something wrong, my child's doing this, Does it? have I done something wrong? And actually, no. And actually, it's always possible to kind of go, okay, we are where we are. You know, my child is doing X and Y, but I've just found out that actually I can help them in this way. There's no panic. There's no shame. There's no blame. It just we are where we are right now. Now, how do we come together to help our children, to help ourselves? So never too late. Dickon. Yeah. 
No, I, I completely agree, Kate. It is never too late. Evidence for that? Well, our brains rewire when we have a stroke. You can relearn to do things with other bits of your brain if that bit of your brain that was controlling mm -hmm. your arm, you know, you, but you can't, but brains can only shift that much you know they can't they can't completely redo it you, you, there are people with living with stroke injuries that that you know they can get some recovery but they don't infer and it's the same with the way that our, our minds manage you know strong emotion and relationships you can change adults go into therapy and they change but it's kind of hard but while during childhood and through particularly through adolescence that kind of capacity to change is actually part of the part of the job description, particularly in adolescence, trying on different identities. You know, I was a punk and then I was a bit of a hippie and then I was a bit of this and a bit of that, you know, and, and, and you have to kind of try things out and then you sort of find, you find out where, well, what suits, a bit like my very nice jacket that I've got inside out at the moment, I might never put it the right way on again because I sort of tried it out and it, and it, and it works. So we try on, and our adolescents particularly are often, they're trying on, trying out different ways of being and getting a bit of feedback and you know then trying on you know what what works so children are natural experimenters because their brains are designed to make them that um in one way so you've got some questions i know that have been sent yeah. through so i thought maybe i'd ask you to to, to throw a few yeah. in. i mean we, we we've got we've got sort of questions that i was sort of looking at some of the questions and trying to kind of just put them into broad kind of categories we've got questions about sort of the the general sort of well-being and development of children you know what does it what does it what does a child need to kind of to learn to be themselves and if you like you know whatever well adjusted or adapted uh, to this world is particularly you know the current world you know how, how, how do we as parents or as teachers um, provide the environment that gives them the best choice so we could think a little bit about that maybe as a, as a sort of place to start and then there's some other questions that are more about when would I need to know when to worry? Um, and, and, you know, what are some of the warning signs to look out for? And then there are some other questions about more specific kind of diagnoses that children often might receive if they've been seen by um, uh, uh, mental health teams, uh, ADHD, some of the diagnoses of different kinds of anxiety disorders, school refusal is a, um, one that's come up quite a few times. Um, what do you do when a child saying, oh, I don't want to go to school, either because they feel anxious around their pupils, or often for young people at the moment are saying, I don't want to go to school, what happens if I, I get COVID or not, if I get COVID, what if I bring COVID back and I kill you, mum or dad or granny? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of extra sort of obvious reasons for, for young people to be anxious. It's not that they've never had reasons to be anxious before, but there's a lot of much more sort of in our faces reasons so we could we I, I i just wondered kate whether we might sort of think a little bit through the sort of what does it take to grow a brain and a mind and then just start thinking about what 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 when should a parent really kind of worry a bit and 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 and, and we've already talked and we I'm, I'm not sure we fully answered that question of how does a parent manage their own worry and i think i really if you like that would be my biggest take home message if it's mainly parents and teachers that we're talking about it's very easy for us to get awfully clever rather over clever about what might or might not be going on in a child's mind and and conveniently ignore what's going on in our mind and our heart and actually i don't think as well when when i'm my heart's beating really fast i'm kind of slightly over breathing i'm sort of all tensed up if i'm in a slightly calmer place I'm actually quite good. I can, I can really be quite sensitive. I think, I think sort of a self-regulation for adults is probably where we would start because actually if we're not feeling uh, regulated in ourselves, if we're not calm, as you've just said, it's very difficult to then create that calm space for a child. And I spoke about it in the, in the, uh, the, the, the panel discussion that I was talking about earlier. And actually, as someone that's coming at it um, now doing quite a lot of play and art therapy, um, it is, and again, I, I appreciate I'm talking about younger children, but actually this works for adults as well, as I can testify having done my training in it, um, or doing my training still, but play, being with other people, with our children, and actually not having to do too much. So I think 
for me, when I'm, if I've got the kids, if the children at home, they're both at home doing the homeschool and I'm worrying about f finishing this and doing this, it, I, I have to give myself permission to go, do you know what? I can't do everything. I cannot do everything. The children are kind of picking up on my anxiety around not doing this and the other. I'm not really enjoying it. Let's just stop. What do you want to do? And I hand it to my children. What do you want to do? And they say, oh, mummy time. We want mummy time, which is always our cue for play. And someone earlier said, I don't know how to play. And they said, is that a really awful? I said, no, of course it's not an awful thing to do. Not many of us now are to kind of work that, that lovely quote of um, uh, we don't stop playing because we grow old, we grow old because we stop playing. And what I've learned one thing is in terms of my regulation is actually playing with my kids. And I was telling Dickon just before we came uh, uh, to this, I have literally half an hour ago been rolling around doing sort of star jumps and playing cops and robbers with my kids before bedtime because I recognize in them if I say to him, what do you want to do? And Wilbur says his game of what he calls needy, interesting term of phrase, but where I have to chase him bedroom to bedroom. It's a release for him. It's a stress release. And there's lots of laughter. Now, as I go up the stairs, I'm half thinking, oh, my God, I've got to go. I'm speaking to Dickon in 10 minutes. I've got to go and do my makeup or whatever. And my heart is like, Ooh. but actually, I that goes out the window if my son's asking for needy then he needs needy and before 10 seconds in and I'm bursting with laughter my stress response so I just I suppose it's that thing sometimes it really is the simple things of as parents when we can connect with our children in that moment when we are laughing and that is far more powerful in terms of helping them regulate and reducing and getting rid of all that stuff that they've been carrying during the day so it's important I think not to forget the power of play and the power of the connection that we can have with our children and might I add you can have that with your older children as well it might be a different form of play but just sitting and doing something together is just lovely and bonding it's a really there's a there's another sort of really nice follow-up question from 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 the one we were talking about about this idea about you know when to a, when should you be attuned kind of be sensitive and tune in and when 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 would you know that you were over attuning that you were being one of these sort of you know and there's that phrase isn't there? i don't really like it the helicopter it's always for some reason it's always a helicopter mother yes. which is pretty sexist isn't it there are such yes. things as helicopter fathers too um but when 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 are we kind of if you like kind of overworking and 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 and, and not really ena enabling the child to understand that you know i'm i'm, I'm not i'm not godlike i just kind of do my best i really do but but well, I'm if you want to on that then in terms of helping parents to know that they're attuning even how does it feel um you know how do they get the balance right yeah i mean see the way the way i would say is the moment the parents actually started to think about that that's kind of pretty much right because then you then you're ready to sort of say the the, the hardest thing for me was to realize as a parent that I had to be as good at saying I'm sorry as I did at saying that's not okay. <laughs> and, and every time that I said that's not okay in, in a sort of particularly in the grumpy voice that you, you've you talked about, I, you know, and I went perhaps just kind of, I, I sort of stepped slightly out the wrong side of that. I need to be able to come back if I notice actually that is, I, I, mm, I'd better go back. You know, I'm sorry. I, I sort of, that, that was, you know, I was probably a bit tough there you know that was a bit much wasn't it i'm sorry about that and 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 it, that kind of grates often with a lot of our experience of maybe being parented and people are parented in very different ways and there's many different styles of parenting and it's it'd be it'd be quite wrong for me to say there's only one way but what i do say is if you don't get a feeling as a parent that you're on some kind of tightrope and that you could fall into the sort of being too attuned and you could fall into being not attuned enough and as long as you're wobbling, you're probably good. You're probably good. You know, just kind of, it's, it's when you become certain, you're probably wrong. So a little so, more uncertainty. All right, two questions that have come in that I think we can go one to the other. Um, I find, just picking up on what you were just saying, I find breaking the patterns of how I was parented quite hard so I can be the parent I want to be without reverting to type i think it's oliver james that sort of says we either follow the way we were parented or we rebel against it i mean it, you know he, as he said you know that simplification but actually um it's an interesting one and i i think this goes back to you know if i have one message to parents in particular in these times of pandemic when we are so aware 
of networks and connections um, because partly we can't have them in the way that we did we took them for granted but you know parents need to think in terms of who have i got that i can just check something out with and it's we're not very good at doing that i don't think it's just a particularly British thing about it. But the Brits do have a bit of a reputation, don't we, of sort of being, you know, a bit stiff up a lip, a bit not very good at kind of saying, did I, was I too strict there? Or am I getting a bit soft? It's very difficult as a parent to find a few people that I can genuinely just have permission to check in with. But if you do, and you can find that person who, if you like, you can just feel they get it, that this isn't any, this is, this is a balancing act that it isn't there's only one way and you're either on the true path or not, that you're constantly trying to keep your balance. If you can find other people, they help you keep your balance in a way that on my own, not a chance. And I can, I can say on that actually, that's where actually where my best conversations come from. Just go, actually, it is, I'm finding it really tough right now. You will be very surprised at the responses you get back. And if you can load it with humor, if you like, if it feels a bit awkward, you'll find that connection, I think, very quickly, because I think it's the rare parent right now who is finding anything easy. So, you know, being honest and finding best practice, people do different things. Different things work for different people, um, you know, in terms of everything about parenting. But if you find someone who says, oh, well, I've tried this and actually it was really good with my great if that works for you then you can build up and as Dickon said then you've probably got a like-minded person with you then and it just helps us feel that we've got some sort of connection and 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 just to be honest in asking those questions we've got a question in when your child is expressed they have mental issues so again it's difficult to know sort of what we're talking about here but but, but maybe she says very, feeling very low or he says very low when should you decide to seek medical help and i think that's one of the most often asked questions and that's that's for you Dylan. Yeah, i think that's really 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 helpful and and it is um you know so it's it's people should never feel ashamed or embarrassed to ask for help full stop if you feel you've got to ask for help then start asking for help um, and, you know, you could start with people nearby, you know, your school may have a pastoral lead, you may have um, access to, you know, just some friends who who perhaps had suffer. But when, when, when do you think, no, actually this needs, to, I need to go and get a sort of, if you like, a, 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 a mental health professional to sort of think about that. So the way I think about this is, you, you, you can think about the kinds of difficulties that a child demonstrates have they kind of always been there and are they just gradually sort of increasing and increasing and increasing or, or have they has it been literally nothing and then it suddenly happened and if it suddenly happens does it quickly go away again is it is this a sort of a storm um or is this something that is actually now and then and then and then start thinking about where is this happening if it's only happening in one sort of area of this child's life if it only happens at home, or does it happen between their friendships? Much more difficult now that we're in this pandemic situation where they're not having nearly so much access often to their friends. You know, neighborhood friends might be much more difficult for them to pop in and out. Some are going to school, some are not going to school, but so that's difficult. But is, is there evidence that whatever this problem is, is interrupting their friendships and their social world? Are you getting feedback from teachers that they seem to have suddenly their, their education, their academic performance has suddenly sort of gone off the edge of a cliff and it's, it's, it's suddenly not, they're not functioning in the way that they were a few months ago. Those are sort of, if you like, indicators where, where a problem is happening in multiple different parts of a child's life, where there's a kind of impact on their function as well as their sort of symptoms. You know, feeling really upset and annoyed and frightened is ordinary, that's not a mental illness. It's, 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 it's what we're all designed to do if there are upsetting and frightening things going on. And there are, yeah? So that's not, you know, that's not on its own a problem, particularly if the child can come to the parent and say, I'm really feeling miserable. That on its own is not an illness. In fact, that's my, someone would say that's the sign of a very healthy attachment. When I'm frightened or scared or lost, when I go to the person I most predict will give me what I might need, which is a feeling of security, feeling that I could be understood a little bit, what, what I'm going through, and maybe some help, you know? So 
that but it's when you see these things happening over a period of time rather than just a sort of one off uh, and when you see function and you see it affecting the, the the child's life in more than one domain family school social being the main ones um, that we're sort of interested in um, those are some of the things that for me would be the sort of thing that okay, okay actually this isn't this isn't a one-off this is going on and it seems to be getting worse um, and it seems to be affecting more than one area of their life then yeah. I'm kind of thinking okay that's probably needs a little bit more thinking about does that and make sense to you Kate or it, it absolutely yeah. does and I think you've made that really important point that if your child is coming to you to say they feel low that is a sign that your child trusts you enough to, to be able to do something about it. And actually, if we go back to that point at the very beginning, that actually most of our children, again, bar, barring sort of the acute end, but most of our children, if they feel seen and heard, are going to feel so much better, as Dickens said, if it progresses into something, if it becomes more widespread. But if, if someone comes to me and says, I feel really low, what do I do? I, Gosh, that sounds really tough. Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to just sit? Let our children guide us. But to be with them actually gives enough for them to be able to either feel that they want to offload a little bit more or just to feel that someone's got their back and that actually we're not afraid of whatever. We can hold their pain, as we would put it in sort of psychotherapy speak. Um, and and, and there's, there's another. Sorry, go on, Dickon. The good question that, that sort of kind of connects to this in a, in a more sort of obvious way. Um, and I, I'm going to just slightly sort of abbreviate the question because I don't want to, to, to name a particular but there's a, a an 11 year old with with a very specific anxiety related disorder that has various different causes but but the commonest is 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 to do with kind of significant anxiety who's had to go through a lot is just going into puberty there's been a separation and this is a parent who's kind of expressing you know how do I know when to kind of be sensitive and to sort of just help and how do I know to do that sort of thing where I'm parenting? Because actually, as well as being very anxious and obviously distressed, this this child is also being pretty kind of pushy, aggressive, uh, rude, and sort of thing. And, and 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 you're getting a bit of both. So that that to me is like a you know really helpful problem to think about because I think many parents would recognise that. I, I I sort of put it like this that it's the natural balancing at one of them between the parents when should i give my child a little bit of a push you know you've got going on you've got to do this this is the way the world is and when should i hold them and when i'm pushing i often have in my head a worry that oh maybe i should be holding and when i'm holding them I, i'm thinking ah should i be pushing and if you like if you're not wrestling with that you're probably not thinking or or even worse you, you're in a state of i'm certain and when you're certain about a child, the one thing the child is fairly confident about is you don't really understand them. Because, you know, I barely understand myself. And the idea that I know what my child needs or could ever fully know is a sort of, it's a kind of heresy, I think, on their individuality. Um, so go on, Kate. No, well, actually, it comes back to because I think it'd be really good before we leave everybody to go through a little bit about the brain and the stress response. And it, and it ties in with, with both of that and also this lovely question that's come in, which please may I answer. If my child seems to be acting up when I'm around, uh, when I'm not, a, a, my child seems to be acting up when I'm around and behave perfectly for others in my absence, is my parenting to be questioned? Can I please answer that and go, no, no, no. In fact, what that actually means is, your child feels safe enough with you to be able to offload. Because with other people, if we think about it from the position, and I, I think we should talk about it from the stress response, if I am holding in, which actually at the moment, everybody's holding in quite a lot of stuff, am I gonna let it out with a whole load of other people? Or when I see my mothership, when I see the person that I trust the most in the whole world, Am I just going to let it all out? Because that's what our children do. And again, with that sort of pushing away and, the, and, and, and what we might consider to be naughty behavior, which is why I called the book, There's No Such Thing as Naughty, especially for younger children. When we push away the most, we push the people that are closest to us, that we feel closest to. So actually, we are going to get the 
behavior, the unwanted behavior in many respects, if our children are, um, are anxious because they're bottling up quite a lot and it's going to come out in one way and we're not very good as adults at articulating how we feel. So why are we expecting our children to articulate it? Because, you know, these, these are sort of skills that we all have to learn in life. So for our children, if they can't express how they feel verbally, it will come out in a very sort of it'll manifest in a very physical form. And that is when we can sit and we can be with our children again and, and sort of like, you know, I mean, we haven't got time to deal with it all now, but I, all I want to say on that is it's not your parenting to be questioned. It means actually quite the reverse, that your child is showing you that, that they trust you enough to show you how they're really feeling. And then the next question is how we can help your children with that. That's probably going to be for another time. But um, but Dick, and, should we do something? What if it, is, it doesn't want to open up and talk. Um, should we do a little bit on the brain and the stress response? Because I think that would really help. And also with the 11 year old, because you taught me something hugely valuable now that I'm approaching this. Dick can explain to me that when our children start going towards puberty, uh, the sex hormones are all rushing in. And it comes sort of, you explained it to me, and correct me if I did misinterpret, but it sort of shuts down the more rational side of our brain because there's a lot going on. So actually we do end up getting that teenage behavior because the sex hormones are doing their thing and it kind of stops the more rational, thoughtful behavior, the more considerate behavior. That is hormones a lot of the time when, when our children. So that has helped me a lot as my daughter, um, who's going through a little bit of an early stage. Um, as I'm like, wow, OK, but I just remember Dickens words and it makes me feel better and think, OK, she needs my help right now. It's not, you know, it's not she's being rude. Actually, she's pushing me away, but I need to kind of sit with her because she's got stuff going on. And inevitably, she'll end up sort of, you know, curled up having a hug, um, having had this outburst. And actually, it's not naughty. It's just her way of kind of coping with what's going on inside. Yeah, so shall, shall, do you want me to, I've, 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 I've managed to pick my brain off the shelf um, and um, here it is. I, I, I'll, just, I'll use it to just try and explain kind of what's going on in the different stages of childhood. Um, because the, the brain does lots of things. The, this, these green, they're not green in your real brain, um, but the green bits at the back, um, that is the way the brain works normally these green bits about they, they help you kind of mainly sort of coordinate your limbs and things and this this pink bit here that it looks kind of rather rude actually like a pair of sort of upturned legs but uh this is the brain stem which is kind of what keeps you sort of alive your heart beating and things those are great they're, they're rather complicated but they're, they're in, in in terms of what the brain does they're really quite boring and and most of the sort of most animal well, all animals have a brain stem otherwise they wouldn't they wouldn't really be there um in, in the child, even when the child is born, I'm now going to pull my brain in half. Deep inside the brain is this kind of area around here. And we call this the limbic system. And it, it deals with the sort of, if you like, what most people have heard that phrase, fight or flight, or sometimes people sort of fight, flight or freeze. But it deals with kind of how do I react to the world when there's threat that might endanger my survival. And right from the moment a little tiny baby is born, their, their sort of limbic system, their fight, flight, freeze stuff, is pretty much working as it will continue to work for the rest of their life. It's, it's, it's up and running. It's ready. Yeah. As the child goes into primary school, um, they start, you see quite a lot of development out on the sides of the brain. These parts of the brain here are called the temporal lobes. Um, and temporal lobe is where things like your memory is um, encoded and language. Um, but the, the particular bits that we're interested in, the temporal lobe that are going on in primary school children, is they're developing this, I kind of refer to it as like a sort of social radar. It's like a kind of one of those dishes at the end of a runway, it just kind of pans around and it's just constantly looking at what's coming in to my brain about who's doing what. And at the moment, Kate, if you can see, it's obviously much nicer to look at Kate than me, but she's, such, she's sitting, she actually looks like she's interested. That's part of being a BBC presenter. You kind of, you get trained to look as though you're interested, but she's doing it really so well. I'm, my little radar is going, okay, I'm all right here. It's, it's, it's all right, Dickon, you're all right. It's going okay because Kate's behaving in a way that's sending me the signals that says, 
you know this is this is I'm, I'm, I'm looking vaguely interested which is marvelous right now if Kate started doing odd things which she wouldn't because she's too well behaved yeah she's doing that yeah that kind of stuff I'm kidding I'm kidding yeah genuinely making maybe we are running out of stuff <laughs> if she starts doing that my radar picks it up pretty quickly and in fact if you notice I actually did I suddenly got quite anxious when she did that I thought oh my god maybe she is telling me we were about to run out of time yeah so she's kind of sending me social messages that something's wrong that was a pretty tame one what if she'd sort of you know started to make really quite rude expressions on her face or just kind of And sort of you know then i'd have kind of got quite alarmed because i thought well there's people out there watching they've kind of you know given up a bit of time to watch this you know this isn't you know we with this kind of serious so this radar picks up that and how does it know what it's picking up because in these memory banks that these the children are developing through primary school they're kind of writing a whole load of it's like play scripts kind of how people should behave in this situation and in that situation and in this situation and in that situation and they understand that people behave and should behave differently and those of you who've got primary school age kids as they get towards the top of primary school you'll recognize something that happens that around the sort of top end of primary school girls are a little faster than boys generally they suddenly change the way that they start behaving around particularly me as a dad possibly as a mother mothers are obviously cooler and more in tune things but my kids would suddenly kind of like when we we're approaching the, the school perhaps for a parent evening or so or a school play or something we're kind of skipping down the road and having a lovely time holding hands and all of a sudden they drop my hand and they say oh dad look i've got to go with my friends they're like 100 meters up ahead i'll run in with them and i'm thinking oh all right and then and then they kind of run off and then because they kind of you know they're, they're crafty my kids they know me and they think oh, no, dad's too thick he won't get it he needs he needs more help so they stop and they turn around and they say dad when you get inside the school can you um can you just like talk quietly or maybe not say anything at all and i you get this sudden realization that their scripts their radar knows that there are things that dad might say that would be wrong it'd be off script and and they suddenly become much, much more tuned into social embarrassment. And more than that, they start behaving as if this stuff matters. I could be the most idiotic buffoon when they were really small, and they would just be hilarious. And I was actually cool in those days. Um, but then all of a sudden, you become a liability as a parent, and it's kind of part of your job description to be that as a parent. You can't carry on being cool forever. It just it isn't going to happen. All right. So, but this is a critical time at the top end of primary school. And partly it's just as you're kind of around to get starting to get into puberty. But the problem for the poor adolescent is the final bit of the jigsaw is the front of the brain across here. We call this part of the brain the, the prefrontal cortex. It's up here. And it is the bit of brain that distinguishes humans from any other animal species. The other primates, They've got about kind of that much of it, tiny little bit. We've got two fistfuls of the stuff. Evolution said, this is where I'm going to put my money. Yeah. And the prefrontal cortex is the last bit to evolve and it's the last bit to develop in the human brain. So it only really starts to get refined when the sex hormones kick up and, OK, you know, all kinds of things are happening on the surface of the body. And to some extent, you're in the sex organs and things, which are kind of exciting and, and, and interesting. But the really interesting thing that sex hormones do is they start something going up in the prefrontal cortex. And that only starts with puberty. And what's going on is instead, up until then, they've built millions of branches. So you've got more connections in, in your brain by the time you get to five or six than there are stars in the universe possibly a lie but it's about that kind of number yeah um, but in adolescence you get this kind of neurological gardener with his pruning shears and he's snipping them off and that carries on through life but it's really fast in adolescence they're snipping them out they've got plenty they've got lots they've got you know stars in the universe numbers but they snip out the ones that aren't being used or are not, are not, are not socially useful and what this bit of the brain does is what you need if you've got this kind of engine at the back that deals with 
fear and fright for the infants got it they go into sort of shock or they kind of run or hit people and things then you've got this script system on the side that's kind of saying is this cool is it uncool is it cool or is it uncool it matters now what when it's uncool it triggers the ah, but you don't have the braking system which is this bit and it's that that is the job of adolescence is to kind of snip out the bits that that to leave a frontal prefrontal lobe that can kind of work out okay under this conditions why is dad doing that actually it's fine it's kind of funny i can see other people are laughing he's not offending anybody he is a bit of an idiot but that's just private between you and me it's okay and then other situations no this is not okay this actually requires action so you start to have this choice and ideas about sort of making sense of somebody's behavior in the context that they're doing it that it's okay for dad to be an idiot around the kitchen table but it wouldn't be okay if he did it in the school kind of uh, uh theater or, or something you and 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 that's what adolescence allows is that sort of distinguishing how to make sense of behavior in different places and that's why adolescence is such a challenge because this part of the brain is still only working really at a whisper and it never really gets much above a whisper even for adults but it, for adolescence is particularly quiet Sorry, Dickin, but it's kind of, you know, when I love it, I could sit and listen to you all day, as you know. So it's, it's, I think for everybody watching, you can see now why I find it so fascinating that when we start to understand what's going on in the brain, we can start to understand our children's behaviour, whatever age they are, which is really kind of what I wanted to write about in the first place. Because I think if we can kind of look at our children and think, oh, right, that's what's going on for you right now. We can be so much more forgiving of them and of ourselves and think, actually, this is not about my parenting at all. It's just what's going on at this stage of development. And I can help them with that. And it's if we can help, if the more we hear from people like Dickin and understand the science and science made easy, um, then we can start to help build our children's healthy brains. We can parent a healthy brain and we can take away all the stuff that we worry about in terms of the guilt and the shame and kind of go, I can do this. I'm much more powerful than I think. And I think that's where I know we've got to finish. So I just want to sort of leave it by saying, you know, I interviewed one of the great other other great um, neuroscientists and psychiatrists, Dr. Bruce Perry. And I said, what's your take home for all parents? And he said that you are more powerful than you think. And actually, we don't have to be therapists to ther sort of to therapize our children. We are enough. And actually, just by being us and actually forgiving ourselves, being as flawed as we all are, but giving our children the space to come to us, to be able to talk to us, to hear them when they talk to us, is enough. And so I hope that does feel reassuring. We've got to close now. I'll leave the last few comments to, to Dick and, um, and before I think that's we really speak. Really nice. I mean, and how do, how did how does a child grow this bit? They have other people use theirs on them and what does this bit look like when it's doing it's curious it's trying to find out it's trying to find the right balance too much too much so it's this inquisitive curious not knowing confident not to know but wanting to find out that's how you know so if you can get that state with your child as much as you can and know that you won't be able to do because when you're anxious you won't do it then you're in you're in with it we're all in with a chance and you you recover yours by finding other people who can do it to you enough Dick and Kate, thank you so, so much. Everybody, thank you for listening. Thank you for participating, for sending in your questions. For this year, the festival might be over, but this is not the last you're going to see of us. Stay tuned. We're going to continue to battle for more understanding, more provisions for everyone's mental health. We know we can achieve amazing things together. Together, I know, so cheesy, but we can go beyond. Let's do it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for joining.